sexual function concerns in women with cancer. When our bodies are physically changed because of breast cancer, it has the real potential of affecting sexual health. There are multiple layers to look at when a person presents with sexual dysfunction. In other words, the natural process of the act of sex has been disrupted due to treatment, surgery, and the emotional impact of cancer and other considerations. My guest today is an expert in this field. I want to welcome Dr. Stacy Tesler Lindau, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Chicago. Her clinical interests include cancer survivorship, female sexual dysfunction, female sexual function, gynecological cancers, integrated women's health, and medical ethics. I'm pleased about our common connections and would like to mention that I'm conduct conducting this podcast because of being asked to assist in gathering information on the bionic breast study from patients in the community I serve. So I know they're going to be very anxious to listen to this podcast. We're going to take an in-depth look at that program with Dr. Lindau today as part of the sexual concerns in women with cancer. So she is also, my guest, <clears throat> is also the founding chair of the Scientific Network on Female Sexual Health and Cancer. Great organization. Her accomplishments are many. Her demeanor is warm. And so, Dr. Lindau, I want to welcome you to the Deep Sea Journey podcast. It's so great to have you. Oh, Terry, you know what? Warm demeanor. One can only... Um, hope that to be described in that way. And thank you for that kind introduction. Well, you know, I did, I always do research when, when I have podcasts, it felt like that when I listened to your videos or read some of your information, it felt like that before we started recording. So I mean it full heartedly. I really do. Thank so thank you. And I'm basking in the glow of your warm demeanor too. Oh, good. Well, it's a mutual admiration club today then, right? Yes, yes you're right. <laughs> okay. All right. So what I want to do today, uh, Dr. Lindau, I really want first to talk about the Bionic Breast Project. Um, what is amazing to me is that you're working with a team of, uh, you're working with the molecular, molecular engineer, if I can get that out of my uh, mouth, a neuroscientist, right? Yep. And so that's in your work with breast sensation in this project. So I'd like for you to give us an overview of the Bionic Breast Project to start with and tell us why, you know, you started this to determine, you know, solve really the problem of loss of sensation in breasts. Yeah, so you mentioned the the key partners on the science side. So we have neuroscience and material science and surgeons um, working together. But most importantly, we're working with patients. Mm -hmm. And the reason for the Bionic Breast Project comes from the concerns and, and distress of patients of mine uh, who I've seen in the program in integrative sexual medicine at the University of Chicago over many years, who complained about the loss of sensation in their breasts after mastectomy and, and reconstruction. So that's where the Bionic Breast Project starts. And frankly, for me, all good ideas come from the questions our patients ask for which we have no ready answer. And I've had the privilege over my career to link hands with or link arms with and join hands with patients to help solve big problems. And this is one example. So in the program in integrative sexual medicine, about half of the women I care for, almost everybody identifies as a woman, although we are inclusive to anyone who believes a gynecologic approach could be helpful in addressing their concerns. Almost everybody identifies as, as a woman. Um, about half of the people I care for um, have a breast cancer history. And they're all presenting to me because they have concerns about 
loss of sexual function since their cancer diagnosis and treatment. Now, numbness in the breasts is not the sole concern, but it's a it's a concern that actually took a while to surface in my practice. I've been doing this 15 years. And if I can tell a quick story, I think it helps to really shed light on the importance of the patient perspective. Love when stories. I, Love okay, stories. Good. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. So, you know, um, my patients would come for an initial consultation, usually referred by an oncologist or a radiation oncologist, or even their general gynecologist. And I'm, I'm trained as a general gynecologist. And I've really had to train myself alongside other colleagues around the world in how to best care for sexual function problems because it wasn't a core part of our gynecology training. Mm -hmm. um, and my patients uh, would spend a good 45 minutes to an hour talking with me to help me understand the biopsychosocial history around their concern. What's the What are the physical aspects of this concern? What are the mood and psychological and emotional aspects of this concern? And what are the social or relational partner aspects of this concern? So the first visit was typically a conversation with some immediate education mm -hmm. and the second visit, a physical examination. Okay. And gynecologists tend to focus on the gynecologic part of the exam, although my exam was a little bit broader than that, I would mm -hmm. say. My breast cancer patients, I typically was not examining their breasts because they were regularly having breast exams with their surgeons and their oncologists. So one day a patient said, well, why aren't you examining my breasts? And I said, you know, I thought it would be an extra burden to you because you're seeing you know, your surgeon and I know she's examining you regularly. And I also thought I might add stress because your surgeon knows how your breasts feel since your reconstruction, but to me, um, it'll be hard to discern, you know, what's normal for you versus what might be concerning. And, and my patient said, well, my breasts are completely numb and that's mm -hmm. a huge problem for my sexual function. So if you were to examine them, you would know, you would know that they were numb and I could show you the scars and the changes that are really affecting how I feel about my, um, myself as a sexual person. And from that moment on, I started to offer every patient I saw a breast examination with an explanation for how it might be informative. Um, that was a real light bulb moment. You know, doctors have the privilege with patients of laying hands on the problem and just sometimes physically touching the problem. It goes straight to the heart, straight to the mind. Like this is a problem that needs to be solved. And so that's really the origin um, of the Bionic Breast Project. That is a fascinating story and one that I'm glad happened in your clinic. Me too. Yeah. Yes, it's interesting. You know, I, I'm just going to add to this conversation right now because I have a lot of women who talk to me through my, through my foundation work about you know, sensation. They're concerned about it. Mm -hmm. But I always remind them too, Dr. Lindau, and, and I, I just want to make this statement now that so often I think probably due in large part to our cultural uh, presentation, you know, breasts are connected to sexuality for women. Yeah. Uh, but in this realm and what we're going to talk about today sensation to the breast is not just for erogenous re reasons or sexual health reasons it's also for protective mechanisms yeah That's and and i'm i'm sure you come across that with your patients has that ever yeah. Absolutely. So, so I'm, when I'm speaking about what I've learned in the course of caring for people in my clinic, mm -hmm. um, the context is oftentimes it is sexual in that people are presenting with help for sexual function concerns. Of course. But it turns out the breasts do so many things. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we look to the medical literature, actually over thousands of years of medical literature, on the, the female breast, we would think it has one function and one function only, and that would be to produce milk. 
Exactly. Right? The literature, the historical literature about the female breast also helps us understand the social role of the breasts and even the political role of the breasts. I have sitting here, if you'll allow me to, oh, I did I take it out of my bag? Oh, I can't believe it. I've been carrying the book, The History of the Breast in Ooh. my bag. I, I was just going to pull it out and hold it in front of the screen. Okay. Um, it's a fascinating read by um, a late Stanford professor who's passed, a, a professor of history. Everybody should read The History of the Breast. Even okay. in this book, even in this book, which is a really thorough um, uh, evaluation of the of the functions of the female breast, mm -hmm. the the focus is on the breast as a lactation organ, and on the social and political and cultural functions of the breast. When we ask women, what are the things your breasts do? I have lists of hundreds of verbs that women use. My breasts bounce, my breasts keep me warm, my breasts nurture, my breasts comfort, my breasts float when I swim. You know, my breasts help to balance me. Women talk about if they've had one breast removed, they can they they gain a, a new sense of how important the breasts are for balance. Um, you know, and sometimes people have negative things to say, like my breasts get in the way of running, you know, um, breasts do a lot of things and we have underappreciated the functions of the female breast as we've thought about how to help women recover after procedures that alter the breast. We've been so focused on the appearance, um, the, the social um, function of the breast. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, as you know, we've under attended to restoring the other functions of the breast, many of which depend on sensation. Yes. So people talk about burns because they couldn't feel. People talk about the embarrassment of their breast falling out of their bathing suit or their sports bra and not realizing it because they couldn't feel the, the cold temperature or the position of their breast. And people talk about the loss that comes with not being able to feel a hug from a child or a grandchild or a, a partner. Um, so one of the fascinating aspects of this work is really hearing from women about all the things breasts do and thinking about how we can restore the breast as a fully functioning part of a person's body. You took me back in time. You ticked off so many things that I have felt about my own breasts. I remember after my mastectomy, I kept tripping because I had delayed deep flap reconstruction and I kept tripping and I, I went to my breast surgeon and I go, why, why do I keep tripping? She says, you're off balance. And I didn't oh. have large breasts to begin with. And I lived in Tucson at the time of my mastectomy. I was freezing and it was in the summer. <laughs> the warmth. They are that you insulation. They are yeah. insulation. Yeah. Yes. And then, you know, I lived without my breast for seven months and just that everybody is personal in what they choose to do after mastectomy. But for me, I had a difficult time being flat. And it was that feeling of, of, you know, I could feel my sternum all the time um, up against my chest wall. It just was an odd feeling to me. But that's to say that a year after I had my reconstruction, I had my first grandchild and there was wow. nothing like holding him up against my breast. So much of what you said just resonates with me. So I'm glad that you listed all of those things that, you know, the breast does as a function. Um, so kind of circling back to, to the study, the bionic breast study, there's something that you developed. Uh, it's, it's the development of the sexual sensory function of the breast measurement. It's a tool and, and yeah, you're constructing Constructing this for the breast function. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I don't, you know, I don't think that patients often understand what is developed 
on your end as, as physicians, as scientists, as, as surgeons to help measure, you know, what is the sensation in our breast and how you do that? Yes, I think you're right. This is sort of like the, the work that happens behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. If our aspiration is to develop another solution to help restore sensation to the breast after mastectomy with reconstruction, mm -hmm. then we need to have a ruler to measure the impact of this innovation, of this new solution on breast function. Mm -hmm. And there were good rulers, shall we say, for measuring um, breast function outside of sexual activity, but not for understanding how the breast was functioning during sexual activity. Mm. And because it was my patients seeking help for their sexual function after their breast cancer treatment, um, it's really important to me as we're developing new solutions for restoring sensation that we have a way to know whether these solutions work, not just to restore sensation in our general lives, but do they work to restore sensation, pleasurable sensation that people value for the sexual part of our lives. So this was a gap in the measurement tools that were available. And there are established best practices for how to develop these kinds of, of measuring sticks. We work together with people, women, and others who um, had had these experiences. And we developed this measure of breast sensorous, sensorous sexual function. I think we coined the term sensorous sexual um, mm -hmm. yeah, function. And so this complements existing tools that allow us to evaluate fully the impact of our new technologies and our new innovations on the functioning of the breast. If I could just give an example. Yeah. Worldwide, there have been on the order of five or six full penis scrotum transplants for men. So a man might have a terrible injury, say in a battlefield, mm -hmm. steps on an explosive device and loses his penis and scrotum. And in five or six cases, a donor penis and scrotum were transplanted to a man with an injury like this. Mm -hmm. Those procedures are evaluated using measuring tools, not just for the appearance of the transplanted organs, but also for their function, including their urinary function and their sexual function and their sensation more generally. We didn't have equivalent measuring tools for the breast. I like that story. <laughs> It, it opens a whole other can of worms, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. But you know, in, in my, in my interviews uh, about nerve reconstruction, nerve preservation, or using the nerve graft, which, you know, a lot of women ask about too, you hear about a measurement tool to kind of check the perimeter of the breast along those, um, intercostal nerves that they connect or try to preserve in the breast area and where the new sensation is. This is huge in my mind, this tool that you have developed. So uh, I'm really glad you explained that to us. That is um, quite fascinating. And how comfortable are you talking? I know this is, you know, you're still working on this, but how comfortable are you talking about the Bionic Breast Project and actually, you know, what, what's going on with it now? Well, I'm happy to share that. And um, there are a couple tracks, a few tracks of work. Mm -hmm. You and some of um, the fantastic people in your community have been helping us to complete a series of interviews with people who've had mastectomy and people who know they're going to have a mastectomy soon. Mm -hmm. We're talking with these people about the Bionic Breast Project and getting their insights mm -hmm. on 
how and why it might make sense for them or somebody like them to participate in the research that needs to be done in order to demonstrate the proof of concept. So we're describing to people in detail, this is what the technology is like, this is how it would work, this is, it would be implanted at the time of the mastectomy and placement of say a spacer for somebody who's going to have an implant procedure. You would come into the lab twice a week for several weeks between your uh, mastectomy and your implant procedure several weeks later, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think about that? What would be the barriers? Why would you come? Why wouldn't you come? Uh, really to understand from people who would be those who would be eligible for the first phase trials, what's going to work and how, what, what if anything in the protocol needs to be changed. Okay. So that's where we are currently um, conducting interviews and um, you know, response has been really phenomenal. We're very, it's unusual in any kind of clinical trial to be, to start with such a deeply patient engaged approach. In addition to interviewing people who are undergoing mastectomy or have had mastectomy, from the very beginning of this work, we have an incredible patient advisory board who my patients and others they've recruited, um, diverse group of women on a whole variety of characteristics, but joined in the vision that we ought to have better solutions for women for restoring breast function after mastectomy. And the combination of the interviews we're doing now and the ongoing input of our patient advisors sets us up very well for the next step in this work, which will be um, twofold. One will be what we call a phase zero clinical trial, where we will start to implant a component of this device mm -hmm. at the time of mastectomy and study how it feels and works for women. And the other track of science is being led by a molecular, I'm sorry, a molecular engineer, a material scientist who's developing a sensor, a pressure sensor that will go under the skin of the breast to, um, to capture sensation that will then be delivered to the device that we're testing in the other track. So the work is moving along in several parallel and intersecting paths, and our patient advisors are, um, are giving input along, along the way across all the tracks of the work. Yeah, this is a very uh, procedural and tedious project for a reason. So for the listeners, uh, know that this data that is being asked of you is really to set Dr. Lindau and her lab up for success with this project. That's the way I look at it anyway. Absolutely. I mean, there's certainly no point in attempting to develop a solution without the voice and ideas and, and um, guidance of the people who ultimately benefit from the solution. A hundred percent. So much science is done without community engagement. Yeah. And um, sometimes we get lucky, but most of the time science done without community engagement, um, you know, wastes resources because by the time it comes to implement the solution in real life, we've gone too far without the real input we need to create a solution that's acceptable to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love that you're including patients in this. That just really super jazzes me. Um, yeah. So is this then, when you talk about this device, will it be just for implants or will it also be for autologous reconstruction using your own tissue? The idea is that the device can work under a whole range of circumstances. Mm -hmm. The initial study will focus on people who are having a um, who are having bilateral mastectomy with um, implant reconstruction. The reason for this is, um, first of all, having a more homogeneous study sample in the initial study is important, meaning people are similar in the kinds of treatments they're getting because if there was a lot of variety, it might be hard to know what's working and what isn't. There you go. Uh, that clears a lot up. Yep. Yeah. And then the other advantage of starting with this population is that they have two procedures planned from mm -hmm. the outset, whether or not they're participating in our study. 
they have their initial procedure with the spacer placement. And then several weeks later, they have the spacers removed and the, um, the implant placed. That allows us to um, implant the, uh, the one part of this device, mm -hmm. test it during the interval period, and then remove it at the time of their second procedure without our having to do any additional procedures. So it's it minimizes the burden at a very early stage of the research. And so this was another advantage of this of this design. Okay. Okay. This is all this this is all making sense and so fascinating. Okay. Um all right. I'm gonna kind of segue into something else, but this sure. is your this is your real house and your specialty, Dr. Lindau. So you treat a broad range of sexual health issues. And something I've heard you speak of that that I kind of wanted you to touch on today, a couple of things. So I'll start with this. You know, when when a patient comes to you, what do you feel are the difficult questions? for patients to ask about their sexual health and why? You know, the, the first order of business for people to get help with their sexual function concerns after cancer diagnosis and treatment usually is to muster up the courage to ask somebody in the oncologist's office for help. Yeah. And what I've heard over and over and our research and research of others shows is that people are really reluctant to raise this topic with their oncologist. They say, you know, patients often say, I don't think it's their area of expertise, or I don't want to waste their time, or I don't want them to think I'm ungrateful. Of course, I'm grateful to be alive, but now I want help with this. Or mm -hmm. they just feel embarrassed to, to bring it up. Yeah. So that first, we've, we've worked really hard in our medical center to minimize the burden for patients of having to ask that question by doing two things. One, training doctors and nurse practitioners and physician assistants and others to raise this issue themselves. And the other is to put up posters and put out flyers that say, are you having difficulties with sex after cancer? Call us. And about a third them, of my- It gets yeah. them thinking. Yes. And it normalizes. I mean, we don't want to normalize loss of sexual function. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be normal. We should be able to prevent it, but it does that, that gets to the next question that is very hard for people to ask. Is it just me? You know, because doctors don't routinely counsel people about what to expect for their sexual function after cancer treatment, patients reasonably walk away thinking, well, if this was a common problem, they would have told me. So it must just be me. I'm not trying hard enough. You know, I, 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 whatever it is, they, they take the blame on themselves and they think it's just them. And so um, that question, is it me or is this a common problem? It's gotten easier over time because the internet, you can do a quick search and learn it's not just you. But in the earlier days, that, that was a big question. Now, specifically, there are two other questions that are really hard for people to ask and, and that I just try to proactively address when it's appropriate. One question is, is it normal for a married man to masturbate? I've heard this question several times over the years, so much so that I've just worked into my counseling when we talk about masturbation, which we do, and I can say more about why we talk about it. I would like for you to after this. I will. I will. <laughs> We're going to say the word masturbate more times than probably you said in your whole life cumulatively in the span of the next 10 minutes. But, you know, people, people oftentimes come with the notion that once people are married, all sex happens with the couple. And that masturbation is somehow a betrayal of the, of the partnered relationship. Not all mm -hmm. people have this point of view, but it's not an uncommon point of view. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? We published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007, a nationally representative population-based study of sexuality among people 57 and older, which is the age group that largely represents people I care for. Mm -hmm. And we know 20% of men 57 and older admitted to an interviewer that they masturbate. So that's clearly an underestimate, right? Mm -hmm. It's clearly higher than that. Because that's, that's what we know. And then there yeah. is those we don't know. 
That's right. Okay. So not everybody's, not everybody's admitting to it. So it was at least 20%. Right. So uh, masturbation is a normal human behavior. It starts very early in childhood. And frankly, at understanding from my patients, if they can experience arousal and orgasm on their own is a really helpful diagnostic clue to what's going on. And most of the time when a patient is complaining about difficulty with orgasm, the answer is yes, I can have an orgasm on my own, but no, I'm not having an orgasm when I'm having partnered sex. So, so yes to the masturbation question is really helpful because that allows me to say, look, your body is working. The Function. systems are there, you know, it's my functioning. Patient- it's functioning the system. We know the nerves are working. You know, some of my patients who had their ovaries removed or their uterus, or they've had gynecologic surgeries worry that maybe nerves were severed and they can never have an orgasm again. But if you can have an orgasm on your own, things are working. We need to figure out how to make sure they're working in your partnered sexual activities. Um, and that gets to another question I think is very difficult to ask, but a very common problem that people bring forth. Yes, I can have an uh, orgasm on my own, but I don't have an orgasm with partnered sex. And um, what people don't start with is I can have it on my own. They're really distressed that they don't have an orgasm with penile vaginal intercourse alone. Mm-hmm. And so explaining to people that the vast majority of women and people with a clitoris need direct clitoral um, stimulation, whether it's during intercourse or before or after intercourse in order to have an orgasm is a real relief and a light bulb for a Mm. lot of people. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have to use terms. We have to talk out loud about it and make it more comfortable to talk about this. You know, you've answered some of it through your conversation, but this also kind of segues into another question or, or at least conversation I'd like to have with you because this is your specialty, but there's so many physicians who treat breast cancer patients, surgeons, you know, breast surgeon, plastic surgeons, microsurgeons, oncologists, you know, radiologists, on and on, whose patients sexual function is directly affected by what that physician does to them. And I understand that that physicians specialize for a reason that's to our benefit on many occasions and many levels. I understand that, but it's that lack. I don't want to say inability. They have the ability. It's that lack of bringing up the conversation to their patients. I understand that on some levels too, but how do we, I I guess this conversation, Dr. Lindau, is almost speaking to the medical profession right now. How do we encourage them to say to patients, um, gosh, don't normally talk about that, but you know what? I've got some resources for you. How do we provide those resources for those physicians who maybe don't have the time or don't have the inclination? They have the ability, but time and inclination, I think are two things. But I think if they just have a resource like you, you know, we could say, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Send everybody to Dr. Lindau. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, you know, you mentioned the scientific network on female sexual health yes. and cancer. Um, and we're now close to 10 years old. Look, the work we're doing today on this topic started with pioneers um, a generation ahead of me. Mm-hmm. Um, at work, psychologists mainly working at major NCI funded cancer centers around the country, um, calling in the 80s and 90s for attention to this issue. Um, we can credit, um, frankly, Pfizer and Sildenafil and all the other drug companies that that 
um, brought these highly successful erectile dysfunction drugs to market for opening the door on conversation about sexual function after cancer. And side note, Bob Dole, Senator Bob Dole, promoted sildenafil, then marketed as Viagra for Pfizer, mm -hmm. on a Super Bowl ad for the, the big, that was the big rollout. And his message was, I, um, I'm a veteran, I, I have a purple heart, and I have had prostate cancer. And as a consequence, I've lost my erectile function, and this, this treatment has really helped. So there were pioneers around female sexual function and cancer. We have the pharmaceutical industry bringing forth effective treatments for male sexual dysfunction. And the story, the opening story on those drugs comes from a prominent um, senator who links his erectile dysfunction to his cancer function. And this helps to propel forward the conversation around sex and cancer, more really, so for men. Really you know, normalizes that, it. It really, if you can talk about it during the Super Bowl, the halftime of the Super Bowl, it really normalizes it. Now we haven't had a Bob Dole equivalent in the female sexual function and cancer world. We haven't yet. And I wish we could find one, but what, what the, the doctors and nurse practitioners and others in the field have done is built on this momentum. We've said, look, it's okay to talk about this topic. And now we have to implement everything we know about female sexual function into practice. And this is where the scientific network on female sexual function and cancer comes in. We now have a network of people across the United States and actually around the world who convene every year and even in between to talk about best practices, to raise awareness to the oncologists, you know, broadly the surgeons, the radiation oncologists, the medical oncologists, we're here for you, we're available. We've created validated tools that make it really easy to identify sexual function concerns. We're much further along today than we, than we were even when I started 15 years ago. And still, Terry, every single day, women are treated for breast cancer and, and really uh, the common cancers that affect that, that people survive, women and men, directly affect the sexual organs, prostate, breast, gynecologic cancers. We are still behind in making sure people know it's as simple as among the problems you might experience from this cancer and your treatment are sexual function problems. If you do, here is where you go for help. You know, it's a Google link away. <laughs> um, you know, I love the Women's Scientific Network. I have attended webinars, more than one. I know some of your constituents. I don't know who the football commissioner is, but I'm going to see who it is and put a plug in for the next year's Super Bowl for the women's. Let's do it, Terry. You're, Let's you're the new Bob Dole. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I think you are. I think you are because it takes, you know, you got to have somebody who has the, that firsthand experience, but let's be honest. A woman's sexual function is very salient to a man's sexual function. You know, many women I see are partners of men who care deeply about their sexual life together. And, um, I think football is a very good place to raise awareness on this topic. You know, um, I couldn't agree more. We might have to look up the football commissioner as a dual project. You know, you said something uh, just a little bit ago. I actually, I, I love listening to other podcasts. And so I listened to the one that you did. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to some of my fellow podcasters. I've never met them, but they're called the curbside, uh, curbsiders in internal medicine. You said something in there that was so interesting to me that I'm circling back on a comment you just made. Um, something else that you mentioned in the podcast is let's not profile people. Right. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. And that's so nice of you to shout out curbsiders. They're fantastic. And I love that podcast. They do great work. Yeah. Um, good evidence-based, um, you know, reliable uh, information, but in a way that's really relatable. Yeah. 
One, you know, I've been studying sex and aging for many, many years more generally, you know, before I really specialized in the cancer area. Mm -hmm. And I've been asked many times, you know, how did you even, I, I actually, somebody once introduced me with the question, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? And that was the Chicago, the annual meeting of the Chicago Psychoanalytic Institute, where they had invited me to talk about that New England Journal of Medicine paper on sex and aging. Uh, and you know the answer to that question came from medical school. I, I was a student at Brown University. The geriatricians were the ones who um, largely took on the responsibility for teaching medical students about how to conduct a history and the physical examination. We would go to Rhode Island Hospital and practice with patients of the geriatricians running through our history taking and our examination skills. And the geriatricians said, the sex history is part of the history. And, you know, at this time, HIV AIDS was a major reason why people were even sick and in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And you've got to ask people, are you sexually active? And are you having sex with men, women, or both? And there was this whole list of questions. Well, I noticed early on that my fellow students never asked these questions and they would all, and I did. And, and then of course, everybody would make fun of me like, oh, I can't believe you asked that guy those questions. And there was mostly older men. What I mean by don't profile people is you can never walk into a room and see a person in a hospital gown and know, is this person sexually active? Is this person's partner, you know, male or female? Is this person having erectile dysfunction or not? Actually, if you're going to make any assumption at all, you should walk in assuming this person does care about their sexual function. This person does um, value their sexual um, life and um, be, be proven otherwise. Because the fact is sexual function is an essential human function. And while somebody might say, oh, I'm past that part of my life, I don't care about it anymore, um, they still feel that they want to preserve the possibility for future, and they still relate to their identity as a sexual being, you know, more often than not. So mm -hmm. I can't remember if that was the point I was making, but what I would say is you can never judge a book by its cover. You cannot look at a person and know. And if you're going to assume, assume they care about their sexual function. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You, you stated that so well. And yes, you did answer the question. Um, okay. I, I can't, I, with so many of my guests, I could talk forever. And I feel that way with you, Dr. Lindau, but I can't, I can't get away without you mentioning something else that I looked up that you're doing. Um, and it's called the women lab. Oh, Can you thanks. tell us about that? That just jazzed me. As I often say, I liked it. <laughs> I jazzed me. Um, womanlab.org is a website that we created to take all the things we know and have learned of caring for people with sexual function yeah. concerns after cancer and make it available to everyone doctor, you know, you said again, how do we get the doctors and nurses and others to talk about the issue? We make it easy by putting everything we know out there. So um, womanlab.org has information about sex after cancer. We've also studied sexual function in the setting of cardiovascular disease. We've even studied sexual function in the context of dementia which is you know, increasingly a highly prevalent condition. And guess what? Most people living at home with dementia, they have a partner, they're sexually active. Mm -hmm. So um, woman, woman Lab is um, inclusive of everybody who loves women, um, who identifies as women, who believes that a woman-centered approach could be helpful. And um, it's the way of scaling up, you know, what happens one by one by one behind the closed door of the clinic, making that information available to the whole world to use. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when we look at the data, I think at last look about 20 or 30% of the people who, who access the website um, have a male gender identity. And we've seen people accessing the website from virtually every country on the planet earth. Oh, um, so, so more amazing. to come at Woman Lab. I hope it'll be helpful to you and, and the people who are listening. I'm so putting that in the show notes. Um, okay. One last question. 
Sure. We talked about this before we started recording. (laughs) So I understand that you live in a fraternity, as you call it. (laughs) And I have done so for quite a bit of my adult life. Do you want to explain what that means and how you preserve your uh, status in the male fraternity? Go ahead. Let's have a little fun with this. I couldn't. Wow. <laughs> you and I both were that. Were that. I, I don't know. For people who went to colleges with fraternities and sororities, there were the house. There was the house mom in in my sorority. You know. So I think of myself as the house mom in, in my household, where we have three sons. Um, and th- our house has always sort of been a magnet for where, where people want to come and hang out. So the three sons have their friends and their friends. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Maybe this is true for you too. At home, it's not hard. It's not hard to know who's in charge. Like I am the queen of this castle. There's, there's just no other queen. Okay. Um, at work, it's predominantly women, you know, in my lab, woman lab, um, not all women, but mostly, um, I'm a gynecologist. So most of my patients are women. And, and at home it's balanced out with, with the male, um, energy. And, uh, you know, if you had asked me in college, would I rather live in a sorority house or a fraternity house? I probably would have chosen the fraternity house. Okay. <laughs> Although that wasn't really, well, that wasn't frowned so, upon, I think. Sort of full disclosure, but not, <laughs> not saying a whole lot. Yeah. I have been inside literally my son's fraternity house. And I don't, I'm just going to say, I wouldn't want to live. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there is the messy, there is like the sticky beer problem and the bathrooms are not appealing. Yes. But like the vibe, the vibe is. The vibe, because you know what? Those boys that gather in your house due to your boys I mean, some of them to this day, they're adults with children. I still love them like, you know, third and fourth sons. So it is fun. And yes, you do have to establish your position either with the side eye or the hand on the hip or just (laughs) a subtle comment, you know? (laughs) Exactly. No, I, I think I feel like it's very clear. You know, there's, like I said, there's one queen in this castle. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm happy that we share that. um, We share that status. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I'm happy that we share is this information that we want to get to not only patients, but to other physicians and healthcare providers. And I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day because I know what your clinic, your research and all that is like. So I'm very grateful for you spending time with me today to help educate others about this. So uh, again, Dr. Stacy Lindau and the bionic breast, just watch this space because hopefully we'll have more on that soon. Thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the honor and privilege of spending time with you and for all your advocacy. So important. Thank you so much.